Chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. So some of y'all are like, Micah, we just heard Bojo talk about that. I know, and I'm going to tell you how cool this church is and how you know it's completely spirit-led. Bojo, me and Bojo meet every single Sunday uh, in the office before service because uh, we, we used to get to see each other a lot. We don't get to see each other as much anymore. So that's kind of our once-a-week sit-down fellowship, pick at each other kind of thing. And uh, he was telling me, he was like, man, I got a cool transition. It's on Matthew chapter 28. And I was like, are you kidding me right now? Like, you just stole the entire sermon today. But guys, isn't that cool? Like, that's how God works. I can't tell y'all how many times that happens with the transition and the sermon and the worship team and everything all coming together. And then one other thing is, is I, I promise y'all, I didn't plan on wearing a blue shirt today. And I look around and all of our men that are being appointed and anointed deacons today have the exact same shirt on. It's pretty crazy, right? but I look better than they do in the shirt. <laughs> Amen. All right, I've given you forever to get there. Chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let us pray. Father, I, I, I praise you for confirmation. Um, each and every Sunday, you continue to pour confirmation on this church and the leadership of this church. I thank you for that. I truly believe that's because we are doing our best to be obedient to you, God. Uh, Father, I thank you for the men that we are going to be appointing and anointing today. Um, Father, you know this, but I need this congregation to hear it. This has been a, uh, a long, drawn-out test, a lot of prayer. Uh, Father, we don't come to these decisions lightly because we want you to make those decisions and it's so important that we know it is you making that decision and not our own selfish pride. So, Father, I thank you for giving us clarity on the decisions that we've made and the decisions going forward from here on with more deacons to come. Father, I, I thank you for the people that are here, the support that not only they're giving this church, uh, Father, but the, again, these men that are being uh, anointed today. Um, Father, it's so cool to see family and friends that come and support. That just shows you that these men that we're doing this for today, Father, they've touched the lives of many. And I thank you for their leadership that they've already put forth. Father, today you've given me a message. And in this moment, I need you to anoint me from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Father, I need you to take all my pride, my selfishness, my anger, my attitude, my doubt. Father, I ask that you take that all the way from me today and you replace it with your love, your discernment, your meekness. Father, your wisdom. I ask these things in your name. Help us to love, laugh, and forgive. Amen. Whoops. Okay. On April the 15th, 1912, a great tragedy took place where over 1,500 people lost their lives. Because of Leonardo DiCaprio, most of y'all know this story of the Titanic. The Titanic was the greatest ship ever built at that time. Someone even made a terrible comment and said, even God can't sink this ship. But what most people don't know about the story of the Titanic is the story of the missing key. This picture that you see up on the screen, this is the Titanic literally leaving England. Okay, This is right just minutes before it was leaving England for its voyage. There's a man in the bottom right corner, if we go to the next picture. That man is David Blair. David Blair was the second officer assigned to be on the Titanic. But the day before the Titanic was set to sail, he was assigned to another ship. 
The problem with all this was is David had something in his pocket. He had the key to the lockbox that was in the crow's nest. And in that box was a pair of binoculars. There's a missing key today in our country and in our culture. This missing key has led to total chaos in our churches and also in our homes. That missing key is the absence of what I call warrior discipleship. Today I'm starting a series that I'll continue on for a few weeks. This whole series is based on discipleship. Not only how to become a disciple, but how to disciple others. Again, a big problem that we have in our world right now, guys, is that's not happening, and it's obvious. Before I go any further, I need you guys to understand there is a difference between a Christian and a disciple. A Christian gives their soul to Christ, but a disciple not only gives their soul, they also give their heart by fully submitting to the authority of Jesus Christ. There's a big difference there. I need you all to grasp that again before we move on. You can be a Christian and not be a disciple. Some of you are like, what? How does that happen? No, it's, it's the truth. The thing is, you can give your soul to Christ. And, and a lot of us do this. I preached on this a couple weeks ago. You do that because you don't want to go to hell. I mean, that's simple. Who wants to go to hell? But the thing is, is a lot of us take that step and then we're done. Okay, we're good. We know we're not going to hell, so I'm, I'm finished there. A disciple fully submits his entire self to God to build his kingdom. You know, in the Old Testament, when they would mess up in the Old Testament, you had to sacrifice a, a bull, a lamb. You know, it was a type of animal. But the thing is, and it was really cool, God showed me this this morning, you didn't just sacrifice the bull's head or the bull's leg. You had to sacrifice the entire bull. We have to sacrifice our entire being to God. That's how we become disciples. The definition of a, a warrior disciple, a believer in Christ who progressively learns how to fully live their life under the authority of Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he scheduled a meeting. It was the only meeting he scheduled in the 40 days from his resurrection to his ascension to heaven. He invited three groups of people to this meeting. The first group, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 16. Then the 11 disciples, remember it's, it's 11 because Judas is no longer there, left for Galilee going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. So number one, the first group, the 11 disciples, right? Minus Judas, the 11 disciples. The second group, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 5 through 6. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. I do want to stop right there because a lot of people see the 12 and they say, now wait a minute, th there's a mistake here because Judas wasn't there, it was 11. Okay, if you notice, the 12 is capitalized. Y'all notice that? The 12 is what the disciples were called. So don't make a mistake thinking that the Bible messed up here because God don't make mistakes when it comes to this Bible, right? Every, every word is God breathed. Amen? Okay. They're talking about all of the disciples here. That's the 12. That's, that's what that means. I don't want any mistake there. So after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. So the second group is 500 plus believers in him. One other thing I want to bring up real quick about the 12. I thought about this this morning Okay, it's, it's a title, right? Here's a good way to describe it for all of you men that watch college football. The Big 12. There's only 10 teams. In fact, I think in two years there's going to be 14 teams, but it's still going to be called the Big 12. Y'all follow me there? Just want to make sure I pointed that out. Again, I don't want any confusion about the words in the Bible. Y'all are laughing at that. We got some SEC fans in here. They're laughing at the Big 12. Roll Tide. I'm sorry. Let's keep going. The third group, let's look at Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. 
This is Jesus speaking, speaking, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Well, the age has not ended. So we've been invited to this meeting as well. So you've got the 11 disciples, 500 plus followers, and us. That's who's been invited to this meeting. So since we've been invited, I want to go back to Matthew chapter 28, and let's join this meeting. But before I do that, I want you all to see there, there are five commissions in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, they, they all have commissions. Each book has a commission. But Matthew is the only one that says make disciples, and therefore that's why it is called the Great Commission. I just want you all to know that's why we're going to Matthew to read the Great Commission. I want to go to Matthew 28, 17. We're going to join them in this meeting. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Okay, we're going to stop right there. That is basically church service today. Right? You show up and you worship. I'm trying to give you all a visual of how this is going. You know, Jesus is going around the crowd. He's shaking everybody's hand. He's loving on them, and, and, and the team's up here worshiping. That's what's going on at this meeting. But some of them doubted. We're going to get to that. We'll get to that. Matthew 28, 18. Jesus steps up to the pulpit. And this is his first words. I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. In other words, now I'm in charge. That's what Jesus is saying here. I've been given all authority. Notice he didn't just say just the authority on earth, just the authority in heaven. I've been given all authority in both places. So in this moment right here, Jesus is saying, I'm, I'm king. It's my turn. I went through all of that for you. Now you need to listen to me. Let's go to 19 through 20. Therefore, go and make disciples. Notice, go and make disciples. This is not a request. This is a command from Jesus himself. He didn't say, please. He said, go do it. To us, he's saying this to us because remember, again, we're at this meeting. He is commanding us to be disciples and to make disciples. By the way, he didn't command us to bring in more church members. There's a big difference there between church members and disciples. And the problem today, the, you got too many churches worried about filling the seats instead of worrying about discipling what's in the seats. You have my word as a pastor at this church. That's our number one focus. We're going to disciple you. And sometimes you may not like it. I didn't like it either. I still don't like it. Sometimes I get beat up pretty bad. But guys, I promise you, and you know this, you, you don't grow without pain. You don't grow without some losses. We will disciple you in this church. A disciple fully represents Jesus Christ by his actions. Represent. Um, good way to describe this. In the NFL, you have officials, you have referees on the field. They represent the NFL and the rule book. That's what they represent. They don't choose teams, although sometimes when the Cowboys play, I kind of wish... They'd lean on, they'd lean, amen, they'd lean on that side a little bit. But true disciples wouldn't do that, ever, okay? You can't choose teams. And again, that seems to be a big problem with our churches today, especially our world. You have some churches that they choose the Democrat team or the Republican team. The liberals or the conservatives, the blacks or the whites, the rich or the poor. I, I want to choose Team Jesus. 
where we can all come together. Amen? Amen. Now, you may, be, you may be thinking, Micah, you tell us Jesus is commanding us to be a disciple and then make disciples, but how do we do that? Jesus breaks it down for us in these two verses. He gives us three steps of becoming and making disciples. Okay? So, the first one is very simple. It's the second word. Go. He says, therefore, Go. Now, I'm going to be honest with you all. I studied the word go in Hebrew, Greek, Spanish, Italian. It all means the same thing. Go. It doesn't matter how you break it down. It means go. And that means get outside of these four walls. We can sit here all day long in this comfortable, well, it's not real comfortable. Y'all kind of sitting on top of each other today. But, you know, semi-comfortable room. And learn all these things and learn how to disciple and learn what it's about. But if you're not taking that outside these four walls, you're not going. God wants movement. He always wants movement. The cool thing about going is there are no borders or boundaries for us. Jesus is taking care of that. I want you to notice one other thing that I love about this because a lot of people try to take the Bible and say, well, he was just speaking to the people at that time, you know, and he was just speaking to the people in that area. Go back to uh, the verse for me, please. Go and make disciples of all nations. He didn't just say the Middle East. All nations. Number two is baptize them. So you go, you find them, and then you baptize them. Go back to the verse, please. We're going to be going back and forth a lot. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I know for some Christians baptizing means just getting them wet if that's the case we could be dunking some dry centers and bringing them up wet centers they don't fully understand what baptism truly means baptism is your place of identification once you get baptized you're identifying that you are now a disciple of Christ we have to take that serious when, when people come to me and they want to be baptized, I always sit down with them and explain that to them. You're, you're not just washing your sins away. That's not just what you're doing. You're coming up and you're making a statement that you're fixing to give your whole heart, body, and soul to God and become one of his great disciples of what we call the Now Testament. It's kind of like, okay, when you get married... You know, you, you, you get wedding rings. That, that's an identification. I'm taken. And my wife's taken too. <laughs> Made dang sure of that. You know, she, <laughs> she'll go somewhere, won't have her wedding ring on. She gets hit on like eight times, you know. I go two years without my wedding ring on. Ain't nobody going to say one word to me. It just makes. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> oh, me. Okay. It also says Holy Spirit, right? It says baptize them in the name. And it, and it doesn't say names, by the way. If you notice that, it says baptize them in the name, singular, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, because that's the Trinity, right? Three and one, correct? Okay. So, so the Trinity, that, that's also talking about the Holy Spirit. To be a true disciple, you must be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You have to be. That's what baptizing is talking about. If he just, I need you all to understand this. If, if, if Jesus just wanted them dunked in water, he'd have said so. He'd have just said, 
Baptize them in water. Psh, done. That's no. He says baptize them in the name of the three. You have to understand the Trinity. You have to have the Holy Spirit. Or you are not a true disciple. Some of I know we got some guests here today, and I preached a, a series a few weeks ago for, for like five or six weeks on the Holy Spirit. I highly recommend I don't have time to go into that today, but if you get time and you've got questions about the Holy Spirit, please go back on our YouTube page and check that out. Uh, I, I broke it down the best I could, so I'd say decent, you know, pretty good. We're going to finish reading this scripture real quick. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So number three, you have go, baptize them, and then teach them. Notice that it says teach them after you baptize them. What Jesus is saying here is they must identify themselves with him first and then learn what they are representing. The way to explain this to you guys is, is if you go get hired at a, at, for a job at a big position or whatever, okay, you get hired, they bring you in, and, and then they send you through like two weeks of training. That's what Jesus is trying to describe here. Baptize is, okay, I accept the position, but then you got to get taught the position. You know, follow me? Go, uh, go back to it for me, sir. Back to 28, 19 through 20. Teach these new disciples to obey. Okay, teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. In the King James Version, it actually says to observe all my commands. You know, again, I'm going to go football terms here, but I mean a football player, when he practices... He practices the commands. He practices the plays, and he practices, and he practices until he gets it perfected, and then he takes it out on game day. What Jesus is saying here is that's what we have to do. We have to disciple someone and teach them and just keep pounding them with the truth and pounding them with the truth and pounding them with the truth, which the truth is what? The Bible. To where they have it perfected, and then they can go make more disciples. <laughs> Some people will say, but Micah, why do I have to know the Bible so well? You know, like, why can't I just know the stories? Or, you know, why do I have to? I mean, first of all, time out. You don't have to have it memorized, by the way. I don't have it memorized. I know where certain things are. I still have to go look things up. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. I mean, I'm, I'm going to tell you, if you had to memorize the Bible, you sure as heck wouldn't have any pastors at ADD. <laughs> I mean, that's the truth of it. And I can start naming off a lot of amazing pastors that y'all know that have ADD, starting with... Tony Evans is one of them. He's one of my favorite pastors out of Dallas. Huge church, huge following, great discipler. Got ADD. He doesn't have it memorized, but he knows where to find it. That's what you got to have. You got to know it well enough to know what's in there, and the, the, what you can speak. You don't have to quote it. You don't have to. You can quote it without memorizing. You know, that's in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Do you all understand? Don't think you have to be that way. And if anybody ever tells you that, leave their presence. Don't hang out with them. Sure as heck, don't let them teach you. That's scary. I'm sorry, it is. Know this book, but don't think you have to be a genius with it. Understood? And I'll tell you another thing. When you start studying this book, the first thing you have to have again is the Holy Spirit. And you'll understand it so much better so much better so why do you need to know the bible okay well let's say let's say tomorrow let's say you got to go in for surgery on something 
All right, let's, let's just say, let's just, all right, I got a torn AC. Let's say I'm going to go in and I'm going to get my AC repaired. They're going to do surgery on my, AC, on my AC joint, right? So I, so I walk in, I'm talking to the doctor, and he's, he's showing me my x-ray, and he's pointing everything out, and he's walking me through the process of how everything's going to go and, you know, how long the recovery time is going to be and so forth. But then I've got a question. How many times have you done this? Well, Micah, this is my first time, but I know what I'm doing. I graduated the top of my class at medical school. I don't care. I don't care. I want somebody that's got some experience to do this. Experience. I mean, <laughs> I'm also going to ask them how many times, not only how many times, how are they doing? The ones that you have done, you know. I'll make dang sure that. Make dang sure they can move their arms, you know. <laughs> the end of this passage is very important. Uh, the, the part where it says, I am with you always. Guys, if you're a disciple, you're going to get more of him than you will if you're not a disciple. Bottom line, when you get saved and you give your soul to Christ, you're on your way to heaven. But when you truly submit your heart to Christ and become a disciple, heaven is on its way to you. That's the difference. Do you want to chase heaven or do you want heaven to come find you? When you're discipling, he says right here, he's saying this. If you go teach these people and, and, and to follow the commands that I give you, you go baptize them, you do all these things, and be sure of this, I am with you always. That verse tells me that if I want God with me always, I need to be a disciple. Who doesn't want God with them always? Amen. If you raise your hand, I'm going to kick you out. <laughs> like you want God always, right? So start discipling. Become a disciple. That's the first step. Become one. And then teach others. And, and you know, a lot of people, this is another thing, I don't want to, like, scare you off and think that, I don't want you to think that, that you, you have to be a pastor or you have to be a Sunday school leader or an elder or a deacon or anything of that nature to be a disciple. That, that's not what I'm, I, I need y'all to, I hope y'all don't think that. You can be a milkman. You can be a jeweler. You can be a hairstylist. You can own a restaurant. You can work for the feds. That's scary, but you could. I got one in here who works for the feds. She's probably mad at me right now. That's all right. Guys, we are called to disciple. And I'm so tired. I'm tired of watching our country crumble and fall. And it's the church's fault. We're not discipling the right way. We've got to do better. And it starts with you. It's where it starts. Micah, I don't have a podium to disciple from. Disciple at your job. Disciple at your school for you younger guys. But most importantly, disciple in your home. That's where it starts. If you're not discipling your family, you're part of the problem. And I need y'all to know I'm preaching to myself. Nine years ago, I was not a disciple. I wasn't. And at the age of 30, God rocked my world. And I realized that he didn't trust me I had to earn his trust. So don't think that tomorrow he's just going to 
instantly turn you into this amazing disciple. I mean, good gosh, that's nine years ago. I'm still waiting. But I promise you he'll start the process of turning you into that great disciple. Being a disciple means Jesus can trust you with his authority. And as a disciple, that's what it is. Jesus is saying that all authority is given to me now. That's what Jesus is saying. And to be a disciple, he's trusting you with that authority. It's an amazing feeling for the one and only king to trust you. It's an amazing feeling. And it should be something that we should strive for daily. September 11, 2001 was a tragic time for our country. Thousands of people lost their lives that day because of 19 men with their evil beliefs. 19 men shook the most powerful country in the world. 19. We have today in this room... 230 people sitting in here. If 19 men can do that with an evil belief, what do you think 230 can do with the right belief? We can shake the world. Grab your pen and paper. I'm going to write this down. Don't put it up there yet. What are you doing? <laughs> Take that down. I'm not ready for that yet. <laughs> Everybody give Sarah a round of applause back here. <laughs> Only a disciple can make a disciple. Sarah, we're going to have to work on that girl. <laughs> Made me look bad. We got all these visitors here today. Made me look bad. <laughs> Chris. Chris Chris just said good help's hard to find, you know it. <laughs> For those of y'all that are visiting, y'all are probably like, man, these people are crazy. Look, this is normal. I'm just gonna be honest with you. They're actually everybody's actually kind of behaving themselves today, to be honest with you. 